<clears throat> right. Um, so I'm going to start by launching our studio. And reopening the project that I created yesterday. So again, by starting, let's say, project, I'll be say working directory, I'll know where to find my data and so on. I do this by clicking on file, recent projects, and it was called our intro. And so our studio restarts and sets the session so that my working directory um, here, um, if I look at the files, okay, and these are the files and directories in this project working um, And then I'm also going to immediately create a third script. So I had, oh, actually, I see that here I called my scripts as 01, as 02, as 02. So I'm going to rename this one. I think I can rename it here as 03. And I'm going to create a new one, a new R script that I'm now going to say immediately and call S04 Viz. Because we're going to learn about visualization now. <coughs> Um, and there are different ways to produce uh, plots in R. There, are a set, there is one package called uh, graphics that comes, that is shipped with R, that uh, provides functions to produce plots. Uh, we're not going to start with that one. Um, at the end of today, there is time I'll briefly present it and explain the differences with another package that we're going to start uh, learning right now, and that package is called ggplot2. And ggplot2 is part of the tidyverse, so what I'm going to do uh, now is that I'm going to start by loading the tidyverse as we had that we did in the afternoon. So if you still have the same session as you had, you don't need to reload the tidyverse, but as I restart, I close my R and start it again. I need to reload the tidyverse. And among the packages that are loaded, we have uh, ggplot2. Actually, we can, we can see this here, ggplot2. There is the package tibble that defines tibbles. Uh, there is the package dplyr. dplyr is the package that um, provides the um, select, mutate, filter, group by, and summarize functions. Um, the read r package, that's the package that provides, among others, the read underscore CSV. So all these packages are loaded automatically under the umbrella of the tidyverse meta package. And so um, I'm going to recreate um, this the variable, the, the table or data frame variable that we used in the morning um, because it's the same one that we will use for visualization. And I use the read underscore CSV function for this. And again, I loaded my project, so I know exactly where I am, I know exactly where to find my data, and I'm going to load this part of the IPRG example summary wrong. And I execute this, uh, and here we go, so read underscore CSV shows this little message here of saying that it parsed the uh, following columns with specification, ProD, Log2, and so on, and these were parsed as columns, uh, as, well as characters, double character, and so on. And so I start fresh and create this IPRG um, data frame or table, and that's what we're going to use to learn about ggplot2. Okay, so I don't need to load the ggplot2 package specifically because it's loaded as part of this tidyverse method package. <clears throat> okay, so. GGplot2 is very powerful, um, but it has its own kind of syntax, okay? Uh, a little bit like the piping that we use, it has some kind of way of working that we need to familiarize ourselves with. 
But before that, um, it's important to remember uh, the concepts of tidy data. And the reason we need to remember this is because ggplot2, as part of, of this tidyverse set of packages, works with tidy data. Um, so here is an example of a, a table. Um, and in a tidy data, we have observations on the rows and variables along the columns. And that's really important. The stuff, the things that we will want to plot, we need to be able to access them as variables in this tiny data. If somehow your data is not formatted like that, you might end up having a really hard time to use ggplot2. So and, uh, these are concepts that we'll explore a little bit more next week. Uh, there is a visualization module. Uh, but when we think about visualization, very often we think about producing figures, uh, and possibly nice figures, and that's certainly a really important part of visualization. But before producing the figures, and the nice figures with, with appropriate colors and symbols, before that there is a lot of data manipulation, summarization, like, like the things we have seen, group by, summarize, and things like that. Um, and before that there is even kind of reformatting data from you know, a wide table to a long table, just to make sure that the data we have fits the kind of manipulation in visualizations that we will want to do. And again, using this tidyverse and ggplot very often helps. But here, this IPRG data set you know, has a, a tidy data structure, and that's what we're going to use now. Um, so, the main function to produce figures with ggplot2 is the function called ggplot. And that function takes two arguments, and the first one is data. And in our case, the data that we will use is called IPRG. And so this is something that I can already execute. So if I launch this, um, nothing happens, but it works. At least part of not complain. Um, and here the figure, my figures will be here. So this is what we get. If we just say ggplot with the data, we get a kind of blank sheet. The only thing that we that ggplot knows so far is that we are going to plot some data that is stored inside this IPRG data frame. Okay? So that's always the first uh, kind of step. We need to know or have the data that we want to plot. And if we run this command, this is what we get, kind of a gray background. By default, ggplot two figures have this gray background. But that's all we get. Okay. So second step will be to specify among these seven variables, variables in IPRG, which ones do we want to plot. And this is something that we do with the AES function, it stands for aesthetics, where now we are going to map some of these columns, right, to axes on our plot. Um, so the example that I used um, in, the, in the notes is to say, well, on the X axis, we will want to use the wrong variable and on the y-axis, we will want to use the log2 in telling cities. So let's try to run this. And um, I have a typo, intensity. Yeah. And so here's what we get. OK? We still have this kind of gray background. But we have additional information. We have now two axes. The x-axis that is labeled wrong. And I don't remember how many wrongs we have. Uh, let's count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we have 12 different wrongs. So if we look at the unique values of that column wrong, we will have 12 unique values. So we can't really read them here. But I'm not really going to bother at this stage. At the end, once you have your figure, you can start to tweak it slowly. But for now, we're going to leave it like this. So we have mapped on the x-axis wrong. And 
um, GG plot two, we have figured out that Ron is a character. So these are not quantitative values. It's a character, so it's going to create one tick along this x-axis x axis per each individual row. And then we map on the y-axis here the log 2 intensity. And so GG plot 2 will figure out that log 2 intensity is a numerical value, and so it's going to prepare the axes from 16 to 32, because that's the scale, the range of values that we have in this log 2 intensity variable. Okay? And now we need to have a third step um, where we are going to define the kind of geometric object or the yeah, geometric object that we want to use to somehow materialize this visualization. And um, the way we do this is by adding a plus. Okay. So we have this um, a kind of definition of data and mapping of variable to axes. And now we need to use a plus, and that's, um, yeah. it's not kind of the arithmetic plus, but it has a similar uh, semantic. This plus uh, a geometrical representation of this, and these always start with g on underscore something, and now we need to have a visual representation that matches the type of axis that we defined. So here's a categorical data, here is a continuous data, and uh, we could use, for example, a histogram. And now if we run this, <coughs> error, uh, oh sorry, not histogram, a box plot. Oh, it's too box plot. Um, right. Now it will take the log two intensities uh, for these different ROMs and kind of materialize this mapping as 12 box plots that represent the distribution of intensities. And so to produce this, we need to specify the data, the variable mapped to the axes, and then the geom, a graphical object a representation of this figure. So that's how uh, ggplot2 works. Um, we could also save this, these intermediate objects. So for example, here I could create a variable, p, that contains this, the output of mapping the data to axes. Okay. And so now p is a variable, if I type here, p. Um, and it's a variable that contains exactly this data. So there is a, a code representation of this figure, and the code representation of this figure is, to, is stored in the variable. And if I already have this variable p, I can now say geon underscore box plot. to produce my figure. Okay, so um, I have an exercise for you. Um, here, so could you repeat the plot that I did? Um, and I'll switch back to the uh, R, um, R Studio so you can see the code. Uh, repeat the, the plot, but with raw intensities, we use log 2 intensity, and then do a second plot, but this time do log 10 of these raw intensities, okay? So we already have the log 2 intensity variable, um, but you can create this log 10 of intensities yourself. You can create it on the fly. Okay. Again, there will be different, different ways of doing it, uh, using some of the code that we saw this morning, um, but we can, we can also do it immediately inside the ggplot2 uh, function, but um, have a go and then produce these two plots, okay? So I'm going to leave this here so you can see what we did so far. Right, uh, so don't forget to put your green sticky notes up uh, once you're finished or you're happy with that exercise and you have a few 
you have questions, of course, don't hesitate to call us. So, um, there are multiple ways of doing it. And the first way, um, I'm going to use what we have seen this morning and the mutate function. So, IPRG. And um, this, I'm going to pipe into mutate. Um, and create a log 10 int uh, variable taking the log 10. So log, log 10 is a function of intel. So I can execute this, um, and uh, this produces here a new variable double, so number log 10 int. Yes? So that has to be an equal to and not a pointing arrow? Like so here I need Not to there. Uh, on the mutate line log ten is equal to log ten and ten to right? Uh, instead of that if you put a No no this has to be an equal because what we do this is um, a parameter to a function. Yeah. This has to be an equal. Um, okay so the output of mutate is a new tibble that has this additional column. And what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to pipe this one into ggplot. Now, I don't need to specify my data in ggplot because that data is now going, is piped in. But I, of course, have to specify my statics. Oh, yeah, I think the first question was plotting with raw intensities. That is exactly the same as we have here, but we would use intensity. So I'm moving on to the second distance. And so my statics, I need to map my variable wrong to uh, my x-axis. And now to uh, axis y, I can map my log 10 int um, variable that I created on the fly. Uh, so here it is, log in 10. So we see we have a different uh, range of values. And here are my wrong levels. So now, and to remember that I'm inside ggplot2, combining functions, so I need to switch to a plus and use gm uh, plot. And now I can execute this to produce my box plot with log 10 intensities. So I, what I did here is that I combined some of the things that we saw this morning, in particular piping and mutate, and keep on uh, piping into what we have to see this afternoon, the GG plot 2. I could, of course, also create a new variable uh, that I could call IPRG2, for example, and stop here after my mutate. I could, of course, say IPRG2, execute this, so I now have this new variable IPRG2, and then here say IPRG2. Um, I could also do that or I choose to pipe from one to another without creating that temporary variable that I really don't need. I only create it because I want this new column. So instead of creating an, a temporary variable here, uh, but it doesn't matter, you really do as you prefer, I choose to pipe everything uh, on the fly. Yes? So there's, there's always be a need That's my second answer, yes. I wanted to do this to revise what we did this morning, but I can also take here, oops, this piece of code. Um, and so now I don't want to plot, well, I could plot intensity, but that's not what I want to do. And actually, 
the distribution of these intensities uh, are kind of grouped towards low intensity and very few high intensities, so it's not very informative. But I can here use the log 10 function on the fly uh, when I um, Oh yes, I'm missing. I'm missing. Yes, thank you. Okay. And so now, what I see here is look tan intensity because that's the variable that I use that I mapped mod intensity, but uh, transforming intensity to log tan intensity. There is actually a third way. Where here I plot my raw intensity, but I chain another uh, kind of function to this plotting, and this function is called scale y log 10. And the function does exactly what's written on the tin. I scale my y-axis using a log 10 transformation. Right, so now my variable is intensity, it's not log 10 intensity, it's intensity, but it's the axis that has been transformed uh, to represent the log 10 values of these intensities. Um, so three approaches that are not exactly equivalent. So here we do maybe a little bit more work, we create an in, uh, temporary variable, intermediate variable, on the fly that we plug into ggplot2. Um, but that's, that was a good uh, revision of what we saw this morning. And then otherwise two approaches, one where I transform my data with log 10 on the fly just before I do my mapping, or I use this ggplot function called scale underscore y underscore log 10 to change my y axis. Um, IPRG. Oh, sorry, that is, uh, it should be IPRG. Let me um, add it explicitly here. This IPRG2 was left over from, from uh, from explicitly creating um, explicitly creating a temporary variable. And actually here, I don't even need to specify. Yeah, sorry, that was a little bit messy because I, I changed from one to another. So I, ex I create this IPRG2 variable, and then I have to specify it into ggplot2, or I create this new column on the fly, and then I pipe into ggplot2, and then I don't need to specify um, the, the data argument the second time. Okay, so let's learn a little bit more about some customizations. Um, that um, I can do with these ggplot figures. So there are tons and tons and tons of ways to customize the functions, change little bits here and there. We are not going to spend hours and hours looking at this customization. I'll just mention a few. Um, and this one is uh, particularly um, useful, I think. Um, so let me use my kind of standard plot here with my two intensities here. Um, and that would be to define a, a third aesthetic, not only mapping to x and y, but another one called fill. 
that you can use with box plots. And for example, um, here, if I specify fill condition, it will uh, color or fill my different box plots. By the way, here I have runs, but based on the four different conditions that I have. Okay, so it happens that my three first runs here belong to condition one, and then the three next ones, condition two, and so on. Okay, so that's with the fill argument. There is also a color argument, and I think the two spellings exist, uh, but the color would uh, kind of color the outside of the box plots. So if you would have a scatter plot with dots, you would use color. But in this case, color maybe looks a little bit weird. Or if you like it, you can do it like this. But so if you want to color the inside of the plot, of the box plots, you would use the fill argument. But fill or color work the same way. Okay, so you use another variable, in this case the condition, to annotate the plot using uh, colors. And so maybe some additional customizations that we could use. Um, so there is a, a general labs function where we can define a title uh, by figure, for example. Um, we can define a y-axis. Uh, so we had here block two. <coughs> Access is uh, maybe let's use MS ROM, somehow change it. Generally, when you name your variables in a sensible way, these here will be useful. But if you need, um, these can be customized. Um, and then, for example, the theme again, a general function to change the theme of your, um, of your figure. Axix text dot um, element text and go equals ninety. And so the labs, the title appears here. We have changed the labels for the x and y axis, and the last one here where we modify this part of the general theme, the text on, text on the x-axis, and we define the 90 degree angle so that they are presented vertically here, and we can now read the, the different blocks. So we have produced all this using the geo box plot, um, but there are uh, different, well, there are many types of geos, but in this very specific case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this, remove the geo box plot, and store this into a new variable p. So I store my data, my filling, and my, my mapping and some customization into variable P. Yes? Uh, so I think that this is a uh, theme axis dot text dot text. Is that uh, the dot means something else, right? Oh, no, no. Um, this dot here, here, these dots. No, they happen to a user dot. It's actually surprising that they don't use a, an underscore. Because people in the tidyverse, they are proponents of using underscore, but maybe it's historic. That this dot here doesn't have a specific meaning. It's just like a, a variable. Yes, it's the name. So theme is a function, and axis dot dot text dot x is a parameter to that function 
and we set it by using another function where we say, and this element tax function has an argument that says angle equals 90. But don't be confused by this dot. It's not very nice, but it's a name of an argument. Yes? Um, by default, um, in ggpod2, the title is on the left. I'm sure it's possible to change it, but I don't know why. It's probably, uh, maybe, yeah, probably laps, or maybe in theme, there is something like title, position, or... Um. But by default, yes, the ggpod2 title will always be uh, um, aligned on the left. It was not always like that. That's a relatively recent change. So I have this variable p now. Uh, that doesn't that does the mapping, but doesn't produce any figure. And now I'd like to experiment with different geons, and in particular, for example, with the geon violin. Okay. So it's relatively easy to experiment with different geons, given that now I have stored everything in the variable p. I just need to specify the different geons to produce this uh, visualization of the same data. Yes? So what is the function of labs exactly? Labs is um, so a function that is never used on its own, but is always used within a kind of a ggplot2 chain, and it allows us to define a title. Oh, my figure. There's an S, there shouldn't be an S. Um, so it allows to define the text for my X and Y labels. So MS Ron, MS Ron. <coughs> As you see, normally the X axis has been mapped to the Ron variable. So without this, I would only see Ron here. But I want to redefine this text. By default, it uses the name of the variables, and here I want to redefine them. Generally, this is not needed, certainly not when you work, you, know, you actively explore your data. Honestly, we don't care about this. Assuming that you have sensible names for your variables, they should be good enough for the plot. Maybe at the end when you want to fine tune your, your publication for a paper and things like that. Uh, but that's what these uh, lines of code Okay, so here we go. I test another geom, the violent plots. But one, I think, very nice aspect of ggplot2 is that we don't necessarily need to stop ourselves with one geom. So, for example, I can use, uh, let me switch back to geom box plot. Okay, so that's the figure we had before. But I can now also add another one, geom point. <clears throat> and so here's what I get. So ggplot2 is not the fastest uh, plotting package. But here's what I get. So I have my box plots. And on top of these bo box plots, I have the individual points for all my intensities for Run one, run two, or my second and third run, and so on. Okay, and so these points are perfectly aligned on uh, you know, these individual lines representing different points. So this is not really useful because, given the fact that all these points are aligned, it's actually quite difficult to know if I have more points here than there. And we know we have more points here. We see this from distribution. So instead of using G on point, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use G on jitter. And so what G on jitter does is that it's going to add a little bit of noise in our data, move the points a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right. But this positioning on the x-axis has no meaning, right? 
all these points are associated with this wrong. The actual numerical values are along the y-axis, and these are not changed. But instead of aligning all the points here, some of the points are pushed to the left, to the right, randomly, so that we can see how these points distribute. Now, it's not very uh, useful, uh, so we can improve this. And so one way to improve this would be to say um, alpha equals 0 0.5. Let's try to see if that works. Um, let me go a little further down, alpha is equal to 2. So the alpha defines the alpha channel. That's the level of transparency that we have for points. So the default alpha channel is 1. That means that one point is completely opaque. Oh. Oh. Um, and here, um, the points are kind of transparent. And the level of transparency is 0 0.2. That means that we need to have five points that overlay until we have a, a fully black point. Okay. That's often a technique that we can use to kind of estimate the density of points. Because if the point is opaque, whether we have one point or a thousand points of overlay, it looks like a black spot. Okay. But still, given the number of points that we see here, it's not very useful we don't see the box plots anymore at all. So this is something that we can address by simply switching the order of the geos. So we have P, contains the data, maps the axes, and then we start by plotting geom jitter, and then on top of that, we plot the box plot. And we can control this by defining the order of the geoms. Yes? For the uh, alpha, why do it just the transparency? Of the different points, yes. And this applies to the jitter visualization. So this parameter is now a parameter that is local to the jitter geo, but does not apply to any other geoms that we would have used. Whereas the parameters that we defined in P, these are global parameters. But here we say, for all the points that are produced by geom jitter, use a transparency uh, alpha channel of 0 0.2. Yes? But this jitter, I mean, doesn't really add information. To the um, it's, more, it's that we kind of see the distribution of points, but we don't necessarily need it, no. It's really an example to show you that you can overlay different geos, but in this case, a box plot would probably be enough. Especially that the distribution of all these values, these have been already normalized. So the distributions are very similar. Um, so indeed, it doesn't bring very much here, other than the example of showing that you can overlay geoms and switch their order. Um, so, a little exercise for you. Could you reproduce this figure here, but instead of visualizing log 2 intensities, visualize log 10 intensities? Okay, and I'm going to uh, move this up uh, here, for example. Um, well, uh, so the, the, the code for the log 10 intensity is there at the top, but. Uh, you need a reminder, I can, I can show it. Um, so if you could reproduce this figure with some customization, um, but for the log 10 intensities. And feel free to use violin plots, um, maybe with the jittering, um, to kind of explore yourself or test the overlay of different jitters. But otherwise, it's, it's very similar to what is presented here. And there are numerous, numerous geoms, and uh, instead of showing many, many, or 
Um, the best is probably to go straight to the GG plot two um, web page. Go. So ggplot2 has a page under the tidyverse, on the tidyverse web, uh, website. And so uh, if we scroll down. Um, oh, so you also have for many of these tools that we, we have seen, such as ggplot2, a set of cheat sheets that provide reminders, summaries here of ggplot2. And you have the same one for um, the functions that we have seen there from the package deep point. Um, and so where can I find a list of all the geoms? Um, Um, no, there is a, the, the web page, uh, GeoPoint. Ah, sorry, yeah. If I go to references here, there is, um, so the references is a, a summary of, a, or a list of all the documentation pages. And you can, as you can see here, we have lots of different geons with little figures next, next to them. So if you want to use ggplot, and you have an idea of what kind of visualization you want to use, but you don't exactly know how the geo is called, you can kind of quickly scan this page. And so you have frequencies, there is something called geom frac, uh, poly, geom histogram, geom jitter here that we have used, um, and so on. So you can, you can have a quick look here, ribbons and so on, to quickly scan these and find out what geo you would need. Um, and then click on that geo, and then you have a description of all the parameters, and then very often some examples here of how to produce these different figures. But actually, the part where I think uh, ggplot2 becomes really powerful is a uh, Another aspect that we haven't, uh, that we're going to see now, and this is called faceting. So uh, let me take this one again here, control copy, um, plus geo box plot. So here you've got a uh, usual or maybe bigger. But uh, facets can be defined with the function facet grid. Uh, and this allows us to define kind of subplots. Um, and these subplots will be uh, constructed based on some variables that already exist in our data table. For example, condition. Uh, and why am I oh, sorry. So I still have my full data set. Um, So this is the same box plot, but instead of having uh, my uh, ROM, I have my technical replicate. Again, they're colored by condition. But <coughs> if I want to create different subplots for the different conditions, I define, I use this facet, uh, this new fu function, facet underscore grid, and then the tilde saying this grading or these different facets should be defined by the variable condition. And this will now automatically split my figure into four sub-figures, one for each condition, and then produce the plot for these different conditions. 
Um, now we could um, let's try. I'm going to try another example. I'm not sure if it's going to look very nice, but um, if here I take Ron and Bio Replicate, it's not going to be very elegant, but at least it's meant to show you that um, I can define kind of two variables here, Bio Replicate and Condition, and so I'll have a kind of a matrix, and the rows will be defined by the conditions, uh, sorry, that's by your replicate. And the, yes, the first one, you know, first dimension is always along the rows, and the second one, conditions, and then my different data will be plotted in these different plots. Now it happens that uh, my first runs are all in condition one, my second runs are all in condition two, that's why this figure looks very kind of naked, very empty. That's the nature of the data. Um, so I could use here bio replicate to make it less sparse. But anyway, so the point is that with grid, you can, if you have to, specify two variables to split your data, not along kind of a single line, but among, along a grid of subplots. And these different subplots are called facets. Um, I'm going to produce a slightly more interesting result here. IPRG dollar uh, X sample. I have created a, a fourth variable here in our PRG that I called capital X. And so instead of the replicate here, I'm going to use capital X. And capital X are values from one to four draw randomly, and I took 36,302. Um, and so here I have now my variable X, one, two, and three. And so in this case, I have um, Condition one, and I have values condition one that map to x one, x two, x three, x four. Actually, if I take tech wrap because my bio wrap and my condition actually are the same. Okay, so maybe now it's a little bit more interesting. I have technical replicates A, B, and C. I have four conditions, and I have four variables that are defined randomly uh, as X here. And now I see my kind of subplots for these two, uh, for my technical replicates A, B, and C, for these two factors, conditions, and X. And so generating a relatively complex figure like this with faceting, uh, is relatively easy. You know, all the magic happens here with facet grid. Producing a figure like this without faceting. Again, it's possible, but it takes I don't know, 20 or 30 lines of code. And the difficulty is not to produce to write 10 or 20 lines of code, but very often when we do our data analysis, this is only one of the figures that we want to create to quickly get a hint about the data. For example, here we see that whatever the condition, whatever the value of x here, and whatever the technical replicates, we have similar distributions, but that's because it's the data that's the way it is. And anyway, one, two, and uh, one, two, three, four here don't, don't have much of a meaning. But this would be only one of the figures that we produce during our data analysis, so we want to be able to produce them very, very quickly to know what we are looking for and move on. So if we had to produce 20 or 30 lines of code to produce a figure like that, the whole analysis would take much more time and much more pro to um, box. Okay, so faceting 
extremely, extremely useful. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I did what I did here, so let me um, show this in detail. So the sample function, if I just say sample 4, it's going to do a permutation from values 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, so, you see, every time I run it, I get a different permutation of 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, if now I say I want a permutation of 1, 2, 3, 4, um, but I don't want, well, I want to draw from values 1, 2, 3, 4, but in total I want 10 of them, that's not possible, because I only have 4 to draw from. So I have to say, with replace equals true. So instead of having a back with values 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I take the first one, the second one, what I do is I take one, I record it, and then I, then I put it back in the, in the back. So that's replace. So here, I have a pool of four values, and I draw 10 times out of this pool of four values, and the four values are all equally uh, likely to be drawn. And so what I do here is that I created four, but I could have created two or three. And how many times, how many draws do I want? But actually, the number corresponding to the number of rows of IPRG with replacement. And so I create this, I, this new variable, capital X IPRG. Uh, I can assign it like this to quickly create a, a new variable that I could use for my my facet. So once we have these figures, we will want to save them. And if we use RStudio, we can do this by clicking on this export button here. If I click on export, I can save as image or save as PDF. I suppose I right, uh, save as image here. Uh, I can choose different formats, PNG, JPEG, TIFF, and so on. I choose a name for my plot and choose directory where to store it. Um, similarly here, save as PDF, uh, the size of my uh, the paper, where well, I want to print it, portrait, landscape, a name again, and a directory. Uh, so that's with the little export button here, where I can save these figures manually. The little button up here. But sometimes you can't do it manually in our studio. For example, if you have you know, 500 genes of interest and you want to produce a figure for each gene, you can't necessarily you know, produce this code of GG2 500 times and then click export. Um, so there is also, there are R commands to export the figures that we produce immediately to a file instead of um, viewing them or displaying them on screen, we would want to display them in the file. And so for example, if we want to do this in a PDF file, we could use the PDF function. Uh, so look, if I have the files here, so this is my word directory, so if I call PDF, Nothing else has happened other than preparing a file called rplots.pdf. Okay. So this is now my active device. Everything that I'm going to plot from now on is not going to be displayed on screen in this tab, but it's going to be displayed inside this PDF. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, let me copy and paste this here. So now I. And, and as you can see, the size of this file is zero. So I'm going to execute this. So the code gets executed, but it's not going to be displayed on screen. Okay, this is the, the, the view that we had before. It's going to be rendered um, in this file device. And now I need to say, well, stop now, close the device. This is done with the function def.off. And that now closes the device, kind of finalizes the rplots.pdf file. It has now a size. And now I can open it. 
and here's my figure. So you can use uh, the button here, or you can use these functions, PDF, that will off. So there is a function PDF to write your, function, your plots to PDF files. There is a function PNG and so on. Okay. But probably it's not the best thing for me to use the defaults in PDF. But what I would rather want to do is to say, well, I want to create this PDF file, but I want to create it in the fixed directory. Right, I created this directory to store all my files, and maybe I'll call it faceted box plot dot pdf. So I'm going to execute this chunk of code. So now it's finished, and now if I check um, in my files, in my data directory, oh sorry, no, not my data directory in my fixed directory, here I have this figure as it was named here in my argument. So I'm going to delete this argument. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because I have this fixed directory to produce all my figures, or to store all my figures. So that's for ggplot2, faceting, extremely powerful, extremely useful. And the concept of ggplot2 is defined here, where we define data, we define some mapping, some statics, and then eventually the appropriate geo that we want to use to visualize the data. Yes? Uh, just a very maybe quick question. Uh, what does a dot and then what do you explain? Oh, so, uh, here. <clears throat> so this means the fixed directory in my current directory. So when I start with dot slash or actually without, without, it doesn't matter. It will be the same. Um, however, if I want to store my figure in a directory that is not in my working directory, but I have to move one level uh, back that I would, you, you, need, you need to use two dots. Okay, two dots would be one level up, and then, for example, I don't know, R. See, so I'm uh, in R intro. So dot dot means one level up, and in this one level up, I have an R directory, and so if I run this, it will pr produce my figure inside here. And so, that all it looks where you are right now. Yes, and that's why if I don't say anything, it looks in my current directory, in my working directory. And that's fine because I defined this R Studio project yesterday, and whenever I work on this project, I, uh, this project as in, as in this data analysis, I open my R project, and I know that I'll, I'll always start in the same directory. Yes? Um, if you're wanting to read your plots directly to a PDF file, um, is it possible to make uh, multiple plots into the same PDF? Or would you make yes, PDF? yes. Okay. So, um, if, you to, to, if you wanted to file a plot in the same PDF, let's say your plot's plot, then it should just be in So you want to have multiple figures in, your, in the same yeah, PDF file? multiple visualizations. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I press the bottom, and now this is super small, and I don't know what I pressed. Um, if somebody knows Windows and can come and help me, uh, no, no, I have no idea what I did. You. Actual size. Oh, actual size. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> too big? Too big? Maybe that's a little way too big. Normally, with control and plus yes. minus, you can. 
I'm sure that's not something to get on. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's try this. Um, so I'm going to copy and paste this code. Um, so I'm going to leave, leave it as it is, so that's what worked. And then I'm going to create a figure where, with an underscore two um, here. And, that, and so inside here, I'm going to open my device. And then instead of producing one figure, I'm going to produce two figures. And uh, let's just not use any coloring here. I'm going to use any uh, fill so that we see that we have different figures. So I create, I open my device. Here it is in fix. So the, this new file has been created, has been opened. I could not open it yet. I need to close the device before it's accessible. I produce my first figure here. I produce the second figure here. And then I close my device. And actually, if we already look at the size, the first one was 14 KB, and this one is 25 KB. And so if I open it, first one, second one. Okay, so I could create 100 figures in one PDF, or I could pre produce one PDF per figure, depending on what my needs are. So a couple of words about, um, and, and very, very briefly about the kind of debate graphics. And so for base graphics, you don't need ggplot2, or you don't need to load any package that comes with R out of the Now, there are a couple of big differences between base graphics and ggplot2. And the first one is the defaults. ggplot2 has reasonably nice uh, defaults in terms of colors and things like that. That's probably not the case for base R. Okay? The kind of the defaults are very kind of limited, black and white, not very nice colors and so on. So on but again, this is probably not a priority in the first instance. So choosing the right colors is important, but uh, we first need to generate some figure, and then we will worry about, about the colors. Um, so yes, the, the defaults in base plotting are questionable. <clears throat> um, the second major difference is that <clears throat> while ggplot2 works only with data frames and with tidy data frames, right? because here we say we do the mapping of variables to axes, so by definition, we need to have tidy data it's here to be able to use ggplot2 because we can only refer to columns. Base plotting isn't as kind of rigorous in the kind of inputs it can take. So let's uh, have let's have a look. Um, so if I say at r norm um, thousand, so r norm creates. Um, a all on thousand creates a vector of one thousand with thousand values that are drawn from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. So if I say box plot, let me type this in here. Box plot x it produces one box plot because it takes one one um, variable. So let me now create uh, a new variable called m. Um, and maybe I'm going to create a data frame, uh, something that you're, um, that you're familiar with, maybe with the column on or 1,000, and then another one called b with, again, on or 1,000, and then this third one, c, on 1,000. So I execute this, and then if I say box plot m, it knows, oh, this is a data frame with three columns, so I'll produce three box plots, one for each column. Okay, that's very convenient, kind of box plot 
um, has a good intuition of how to visualize a vector on the box plot or a, uh, a data frame on the box plot. But sometimes that's kind of less useful, right? So that's the second major difference with ggplot2. Uh, ggplot2 takes data frames, uh, tidy data, whereas space graphics, and, and ggplot2 was, has one function, ggplot2, where you define your data, your aesthetics, um, and then a set of geoms that you can build up the way you want. Base graphics has all sorts of uh, function. There is box plot to produce box plots. There is a function hist to produce histograms. Uh, there is a function plot um, to, for example, um, right if I want to do a scatter plot of the value here of x and my first column of m, I would use plainly plot. Um, so it's kind of, you know, not as well defined, as not, not as rigorously defined as in uh, ggplot2. ggplot2, you'll always start with the function ggplot2, define data and statics, and then you, depending on how you have mapped your data, you would define the geo that you want. Yes? So when would you use base graphics? Yes, that, that's a good question. So if your data is in a data frame, and a kind of a tidy, tidy form, then I think uh, ggplot2 is the natural candidate. Because if your data is already like that, chances are that you have already used some of these functions that we saw this morning. They come from a dplyr package. Okay? Some of this, these dplyr functions. And that's kind of natural to keep on producing figures with ggplot2. Or if you need um, any figures with faceting, like the one shown here. Do something like this with base plotting is not impossible, but would be a hassle compared to this relatively elegant code uh, here. So clearly, if, if you want faceting, if you have that kind of data, it's probably already in a tidy data set, and ggplot2 is the way to go. But not all data necessarily fits in a tidy data set, or that's not how you get it. So, for example, if we look at this um, right, M data frame, um, this could very well be, um, let me say, hat of M. Okay? This could be um, kind of an omics data set where I have 1,000 proteins and three samples. It could be much bigger. And so, if that's the way you have your data, doing box plot M. Um, that's an R Studio error here. Yeah. You know, feels very, very natural. And maybe it's not as nice, but it works out of the box and it tells you exactly what you want to do. So if M is the data structure that you have and it fits the data that, that you store, I would not necessarily kind of force myself to convert it into a long of tidy data to produce the visualization. If I have additional metadata, maybe I want to do that because I want to use faceting. Will we discuss at some point how to make data tidy? Um, we will not in this module. I'll talk about it next week in the visualization module. I don't know how many of you plan to stay next week uh, for the visualization module. Okay. Um, uh, but that's something I could uh, show briefly, maybe at the end of today or tomorrow. Uh, and actually, I have another question for you um, before we. Okay, so there is, there is no kind of clear question. There are camps. Some people say, "Oh no, I always use ggplot2," but I think that's because their data is naturally into a data type data frame. It's not always at, as black and white. Anyway, I think it's it's important as people that analyze data to know multiple tools, ideally multiple programming languages, but certainly if you know one programming language, not use only ggplot2 or dplyr, use it when it suits us, but realize that they're, you know, these are not the only ways. And so a last important difference is that ggplot2, uh, as we have seen, kind of works with variables, right? P, this variable P is there, and I can use it and reuse it. 
base graphics works as a kind of a painter model. So for example, if I say here, um, box plot M, and there is something that I don't like here, I have to start from scratch, produce my new plot, right? I don't produce any variable here. There is nothing I can reuse. So for example, uh, here I can say, uh, a b line vertical equals zero color equals rat. Okay. Um, actually, it's not a vertical line that I want to plot, but a horizontal line. Okay, so I add this horizontal line at zero on top of my box plot. Um, and so it's really like a painter model. You know, I start with a blank canvas and then I plot my box plot. And then on top of that, I draw my red line. If I'm not happy with this, uh, I start from scratch. And I have a new canvas, and I have a new box plot. And maybe I draw um, yeah, a new horizontal line, or two horizontal lines, one at minus one, and the other one like this. So there is no concept of storing the figure, the visualization, as a variable in base plotting as we have with and just for the sake of completeness, there is not a, a relatively powerful visualization package that is called Lattice. Uh, that's a third one that has been around for a long, long time, actually, uh, but has never caught up like ggplot has in recent years. Okay. Okay. So that's what we have seen um, today about visualization, um, kind of the basics of ggplot2, but with with what we have seen this morning with these deep fire functions and ggplot2, I think you have a kind of a good background to start using these with your own data and produce um, some kind of nice figures. I mean, I think I'm always impressed with faceting. I think this is a, a nice figure. You know, it, they can be really revealing. And producing these kind of figures with something else than R and ggplot2. Um, I think it's not true. Python probably has some uh, decent plotting libraries nowadays. Not sure about Julia. Don't know about MATLAB. But certainly, the kind of pro production of these kinds of figures in R with ggplot2 is probably some of the best things that are out there in terms of visualization. Okay. Uh, so I have a quick question for you tomorrow. So uh, tomorrow uh, there is a. Um, so we'll start at nine again, and Nina will take over um, to present some basic statistics and how to apply this in R. And then uh, after the lunch, as opposed to what is written here on the on the program, I'll have another one and a half hours with you between lunch break and refreshments, and then uh, Nina will wrap up the day with uh, some hypothesis testing. Um, but so for my part, on the program we have linear models and correlations. Oh, and then I also wanted to talk about R markdown. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll do that uh, at the end of today, we'll see. But the official program is um, linear models and correlations. And then I also wanted to uh, present a package called Amazon Base to show you. So Amazon Base is a package that is dedicated to uh, handling and analyzing mass spectrometry based proteomics data, or mass spectrometry data, and it can be proteomics or metabolomics, and then also quantitative um, proteomics data. And then I wanted to show you, you this a little bit um, to give you a kind of a hint of with the basics that we have seen um, today and yesterday, and these basics are the concept of a two dimensional data. Uh, or a vector that we can subset with a square, square bracket operator, um, how these concepts can be reused for more complex data types. Mass spectrometry and proteomics, but it could also be you know, microarrays, RNAs, and so on. Um, so I want to demonstrate that a little bit tomorrow. But then instead of uh, linear models and, and correlation, or maybe that's something that I could kind of show very, very quickly, I've had, I think, three or four people asking about, you know, we have these data frames, how can we combine multiple data frames into one? So that seems to be something that is also of interest, uh, of interest 
So what I would like you to do is um, when you walk out of the room, if you could make a little mark next to correlation and linear modeling, if that's the topic you're most interested in. Uh, so make a little mark here at the top. Or if you are most interested in combining, how to combine, how to merge, how to join different tables, uh, then make a little kind of bar next to combined tables. And then we'll see if it's 50-50, we have a problem. <laughs> but if you know we have everybody that says combined data frames, then maybe we'll completely skip this, or we can all kind of adapt my my part depending on, on where your interests lie. Okay? So that's the program for tomorrow. I will not be here at 8 o'clock for a question and answer, but I'm happy to stay longer if you have questions and answer for me. I'll go for a run tomorrow morning and come a little bit later. Um, I don't know if Mina, I think you were up here, so um, she, she'll be here if you want already to start at 8 o'clock. So that's for the official program. If you have a little, so we can of course keep on with questions and answers. But if you have a little bit of time, um, I would like you to show. I would like to show you our markdown. Um, so is it okay if we take kind of 10, 15 minutes to sh to kind of learn about a, another topic that is our markdown with our studio? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to save this and, and close this script was my script four, and tomorrow I'll start a script five. Um, but so, our markdown is two things combined. One is markdown, which is a very simple markup language, um, which is not, which is the opposite of what you see is what you get, like word, like word processors, where if you want to have bold text, you see bold text. You know, if you have headers, first level, second level, you kind of see that there are bigger bold lines and things like that. The opposite of this is markup languages, where you say, I want this text to be bold, I want this text to be italic, uh, I want this header to be level one, level two. You kind of specify it, but you don't necessarily see it already rendered. So this is markdown. Very simple markup language, but simple doesn't mean not useful. On the contrary, simple here is a feature. And it's combining markdown with R code. Um, and R Studio makes this um, very easy. So let's create a new R markdown uh, project, or not project, report. So I say file new file, and now I'm not going to create an R script, but I'm going to create an R markdown file. Okay? Um, so I'm asked to provide a title, uh, my RMD report. Okay. An author, uh, apparently this, this computer uh, knows me already. And then um, I should also choose an output format. So as opposed to if you use Word, where you write a Word document, right, you open Word, the Word document, and you write immediately in the Word document, and your final document is the Word document. Here, we are going to write an R markdown document, and then we are going to compile this file, this RMD file, into something else that is the final report that we can distribute. And so here I can choose HTML or PDF. So I'm going to choose PDF now, but I'll, we can change this later. And that means that afterwards, after writing my document in Markdown, including R, I will produce a PDF file. Okay. So I click on OK. And using um, RStudio, it already produces a template that illustrates kind of the basic features R markdown. So I'm going to save this one and I'm going to call it R01, R for report, um, R, um, first report dot RMD. Okay. So I saved this file in my um, project. Okay, here it is. 
uh, R0 on the first report. And so let, let's have a quick look at how this looks like. So what we see here is classic uh, markdown syntax. So there is a little header with the title, the name of the author, the date, and this output that says the final output should be PDF. Uh, we, can, we can ignore this one for now. And then kind of two hashes is the kind of the first level uh, or second level of headers. Okay, so we will have a, a section that is called R markdown, a section that is called including plots. Um, and then, for example, in this paragraph, there is the nip word that is uh, kind of marked up with double stars. And that means that this nip word will be displayed in bold fonts. Okay, so we don't kind of select knit and say bold, but we define bold with double stops. And so, for example, if, if I want the button to be italic, I would do it like this, single stops. Okay. Uh, and if I remember well, I think an underscore on each side uh, will define the underlined. Okay. So that's the, how we, we define the formatting. Um, so let, let's try it here, uh, the way it is. So here I can click on the little knit, knitting, and the little knit button. And our studio is going to knit the document and produce um, a PDF file. And here it is. So here's the title of my report. Here's my name, here's the date, and then we have these sections are marked down, including plots. And then um, if I look closely, um, knit is in bold, bottom is in italic, and actually document is not on the line. Apparently, underscore is not how you want to mark down. Um, okay, I don't remember the syntax. But you, you get the idea of a mark, mark up language, right? Like it's not what you see, it's what you get. I write a text with minimal mark up, and then it gets displayed in a final output format. And now I chose PDF. But the really interesting bit is not really the markdown, but it's that we can combine markdown and R code. So I see two separate sticky notes, sticky notes. And could it be that you try to knit into PDF and you have an error, and it asks you to install MIGTAC? What's the error? Yes. So if you have that problem with compiling to PDF on Windows, it's most likely that you do not have the software to produce, so there's an intermediate format, that is a tag format, to convert the tag to PDF. And on Windows, typically, you need to install this piece of software called MIGTAC that you can download and install. It's pretty big because you need a full version um, and then and then it should work. So if you have, if you struggle with the PDF, what you can do is here choose to knit to HTML, and this will take the same document, the same source document, but compile it into HTML. So here it is, the same initial document, but the final output is an HTML file rather than a PDF. Both are equivalent, depending on. So um, the slides, the lecture material, here 
is written in R Markdown. It's all written in R Markdown and then it's compiled into HTML that is posted online. If you go uh, on the first page, it tells you that you can also download a PDF of all the material. Well, this is all the material written in R Markdown that is compiled into PDF. Okay, so the output format really depends on how do you want to distribute it. If you want to distribute it in hard copies, you will choose PDF. If your mode of dissemination is web, then you would want to compile it into HTML. But so let's go, let's get back to here, the R markdown, because the really interesting part is the R in R markdown. So if we look into these bits that are kind of grayish, and let's start with three back ticks, curly brackets, R, and then some options. This is just a name for the code chunk, and then they close with three back ticks. This is actual R code. Okay? So cars is a small data set, a data frame that contains two columns, speed and dist or distance. So this is a data frame that has some information about cars. And we have seen the function summary. Okay. Summary takes a data frame as input, and then it will calculate the data frame for each variable. And these are two numerical variables, so it will give us this little summary. So if we look, what do we have inside the report? We have a call to summary cars. That's all we have. If now we look in our output, whether it's PDF or HTML, what do we see? We see summary cars, as was present in the source document, but we also see the output. Okay. Same thing a little bit later. Here, a little bit later, I have plot pressure. So what's pressure? It's another data set that comes built in inside R, a data frame with two columns, one that is temperature and the other is pressure. So if I say plot pressure, so plot is not a ggplot2 function but a base plot graphics, um, let's try to run it. Here, plot pressure, I get the following figure. By default, plot is going to take the first axis and the second one and produce this scatter plot to see the evolution of the temperature based on the pressure, or the pressure based on the temperature. And so in the markdown file, we only have plot pressure, but what we see in the output format is that we see the plot. So that is extremely powerful, is that the, these outputs, these R chunks, are executed dynamically during the compilation of the document. Whether it's a PDF or HTML, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what is important is that the R code is executed and produced. So if I, um, if we look at the uh, at the nodes, um, and for example, look at um, data analysis here or. Okay, man manipulating data with um, DeepMire. Here's some of the code that we saw this morning. Okay, I typed in, I typed this line of code where I select these three columns from um, the data frame, or here I filter out PRG only by the two. In my source RMD document, I only have, only have this line. And this code is produced automatically during the knitting. But that guarantees me that this output is correct because my compilation didn't crash, I didn't have any errors. So this is an extremely powerful tool that allows me to implement reproducible research. So here I use this technique for my teaching material, but I also use it to write my papers. So the figures or the tables in my papers are not something that I produce at some point in time and I'm not quite sure what data I use or how I produce this. It's, you know, the data is there and the code is there, 
for me to reproduce it. Thanks to um, our work down here. So simple syntax, and that's good. We don't want to get confused by overly complex syntax, for example, LaTeX. But what we want to do is to be able to generate PDF or HTML with dynamically generated figures or tables or results. And that's possible with our Yes? Does R modeling work have a good test PowerPoint also? Yes, it does. So if you look at, um, when I use the wizard, I could choose the output as PDF, HTML, or Word. So I didn't mention Word because I think it's an extremely bad idea to export to Word. Why is that? Is that my Word document, I can change it. But if I, if I export to a Word document and I change my Word document, it's not reproducible anymore. I think it's much better to go back to the mark, R markdown file do changes there and then recompile it so that I know exactly that what I have, it can be tags and figures, is something that I can reproduce. Okay. And so as part of these, um, so uh, file um, new R markdown, and here I can choose presentations, and there are different types of presentations, uh, so let's use IO slides. Um, and oh yeah, so here there is PowerPoint, but it could be output to HTML or PDF. Uh, my presentation. So I'm going to use um, HTML, and I'm going to compile this. Uh, let me say first. Um, let's call this R02 slides. Dot RMD. Okay. And let's knit. So here I now have my slides produced in R markdown with my presentation. I can come to the next slide. And it's the same text that we used for the previous um, example, but uh, presented as slides with bullet points. And same thing. In the R markdown source of my slides, I only have summary cars, but in my final output, I have the kind of live execution of this code. Same thing for the figure. And so there was also PowerPoint, but I have never used it, so I don't know yeah, how it works. You used I/O slides for this? Or yes. For this? Uh, I think I used the first one, I/O slides. Um, they're very slidify, um, and there are other kind of types of outputs that you can. So that's all, the R markdown. So the people that had issues specifically with PDF, um, I'm happy to have a look at and maybe I'll be able uh, to fix it. Um, so that's um, kind of all for today in terms of efficient program, but if you have um, any questions, uh, I'm happy to stay a little bit longer to address them. So thank you very much. Oh, and please remind me, um, to, I'll do it already tonight. Uh, so let me close all this. Uh, save. So here's my R project. I will kind of zip this R project and copy it on the Google Drive so you can have access to all the scripts and uh, the figures. Okay. Right. See you tomorrow. Just, uh...